switch over to our last speaker, another lady actually I know quite well. Uh, now we go to Dr. Maisie Eliezer from, uh, she's from Israel. Uh, she's a periodontist and uh, she did actually her uh, periodontal training at University of Bern. Uh, she's always smiling, as you can see. And uh, she was with Tony Skoulian. And she's now back in uh, Israel. And I see her from time to time on social media. And, uh, and uh, then I have an exchange to her. So uh, she, will give us, she will give us an update on a very important topic. And I'm sure she has seen that also in Bern uh, with uh, Professor Chani Salvi. You see peri-implantitis, before you explant an implant, think about other options. And of course, we would love to think about other options. And I look forward uh, to listen to you, uh, how you deal with this difficult clinical situation, because we all know this is not so easy. I remember back in the early 1990s, we started to talk about that, how to treat peri-implantitis. And sometimes I feel we have not really made a substantial progress uh, with this. It's a tricky and a very demanding clinical procedure. So, thank you very the much. The stage is yours, my friend. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Booster. I am uh, shalom to everybody, and I'm very, very happy I could you could join me today. Uh, before I start, as everybody else, I would like to thank Eislich for this amazing, educated, free-to-all online congress, and to thank the online congress committee for asking me to give you this lecture on one of the most challenging topic, as uh, Professor Busser mentioned, peri-implant diseases. My goal is today is to reveal to you how I treat those implants. And uh, due to the fact I have only 30 minutes, I, had, uh, I could talk only about the non-surgical treatment I give those implants. Uh, this treatment uh, I found effective in many cases of peri-implant diseases. And this way of treatment is not so new. I've learned it and inquired it in, uh, during my specialization in periodontology at Bern University in Switzerland. This is also a great opportunity to thank my mentor, Professor Anton Skoulian, for teaching me the way to treat peri-implant disease, both in uh, non-surgical and surgical treatment. But before I start, I would like to pay attention to the, those left, two left uh, um, uh, the website, my website and uh, YouTube channel that I have called Perio Home. Over there, you can find this lecture. At the end of the presentation, I'm going to give you a password which you can enter and see this lecture uh, when you would like to. So uh, let's start uh, these uh, challenging cases. Now, I want to, the, as we know, dental implants uh, penetrate to our world like more than 50 years ago. They are not going anywhere, as I can see. There is no other solution. Last year, uh, 5 million implants were implanted in the USA. Uh, that, uh, we know that dental implants are a good solution for missing teeth. They bring back the aesthetics, back the function, and they prevent also bone, less, bone loss if you do it in the good manners. Uh, but they are not free of troubles and uh, trouble, they're called the troubled implants, uh, need to be treated as soon as possible. I want to show you some cases lately that I uh, run into my, in my clinic that they are troubled, uh, troubled implants that when they refer to me, the doctor said, okay, they are peri-implant diseased. So this is a patient, 73 years old, came into my clinic when she suffered from pain, bleeding on probing, edema, and pus. Uh, she referred to me by her prostodontics during the first corona quarantine. Implants 24 and 25 was implanted uh, two months before she came to me by a maxillofacial surgeon. And after two months, she saw a pus coming out of those implants. Now, uh, this implant is, is not, a, in my eyes, not a peri-implant disease. Of course, they have a disease, but they, they have bacteria over there. But this is not the reason. The, the reason that the bacteria are accumulated in those implants are because of the fracture that she had on the buccal side 
uh, of the implant number 24. As you can see, when I exposed, when I raise a flap, I could see this fracture. And on implant number 25, she had a deep vertical um, uh, bone loss around the implant. Now, this implant, as you can see, was implanted in maybe too buckly, maybe wrongly. I don't know. I haven't been there. But there are no other solutions for, for this implant but to explant it. I was explanting those implants and I augmented, waited for four months, and later I could implant, though I could, re I could put a new implant in the right angulation. As um, you know, Dr. B Professor Busser said earlier, and I'm quoting, the implant must be completely embedded in a healthy bone. And I made sure that the bone was healthy. So now the patient uh, could go for a, re for a rehabilitation in her prostodontics. The next, uh, the next case that I would like to show you, it's an implant that was implanted 45 degrees buccally. Um, as you can see, uh, this patient came to me because she had um, bleeding on probing and bleeding when she was uh, brushing this area of the peri-implant uh, area. Now, when I took out the, uh, the, the prosthetic, this is a temporary crown, I and I placed uh, a transfer, I could see that the implant placed much buccally, too much buccally. Now, the thinking, okay, maybe we could put uh, the crown, maybe we can make a vario base that correct the angulation, but any vario base that correct the angulation still will push this tissue. So she would suffer all the time for bleed, from bleeding. And when I took the CBCT, I could see this grafting wall, the xenograft wall that was placed on the buccal side. Now, my thinking was, if I'm going to explant this implant, she will suffer tremendously from a bone loss and even more this area going to be more aesthetically a disaster. So my thinking is, okay, I'm not going to explant, but I'm going to bury this implant. I'm going to bury this implant, implanted a soft tissue and free gingival graft in the area in order to augment it. And then we, the, the, her prostodont could place a Maryland bridge, as you can see here. So this is another peri-implant disease, but I, without explanting the implant, without, uh, uh, this is not a peri-implant, the peri-implantitis, but only peri-implant mucositis. So to treat the peri-implant peri mucositis in that case was actually to bury the implant and place a free gingival graft and soft tissue augmentation. The next, uh, the next, um, like out of the box uh, situation is an osteointegrated one piece implant at the aesthetic zone. You can see a 24 years uh, woman that came to her prostodontics uh, after she had failed implants, th two failed implant and the last one stayed one piece implant. Now she suffered from aesthetic results. As you can see here, this is um, pink material. The patient didn't like it. She wanted to change it. Now to place a new implant and to place a bone graft here. This is the patient didn't want to hear about it because she already gone through these procedures and she doesn't want it. She said, Maisie, I only want that this pink material will disappear. So what I did, I was, I didn't explant the osteointegrate one piece implant. I was buried it under the gas because to explant it, as you understand, and it will take a lot of the bone and will destroy the tissue. So I buried it uh, on the level of the bone. I was taking a soft tissue and the free gingival graft and also the biomaterial fibroguide. And I was uh, implanted it in the area of the aesthetics. And here you can see five months after how the tissue was augmented. Okay, it's not perfect, but the patient liked what she see as long as this prosthetic was out. And now her prostodontics can make better uh, teeth for her. So most of our trouble implants are not the one that I showed you, but actually a peri-implant uh, disease. And here you can see some of the examples that came into my cleaning. You can see that uh, those peri-implant diseases were caused, most of them, by iatrogenic factors. So a lot of the factors us, uh, us, in my eyes, we are the one to be blamed. Uh, and I think we should identify the problem and think if we can treat it or not. not 
I think we should also prevent it. But if the, there is a problem, we need to think, is it actually something I can treat and actually something I can improve? Not all the cases are resolvable. Uh, can we, we can resolve by non-surgical treatment or even not by surgical treatment. We, we need to be very case selective. One of, uh, one of them you can see on the left, right? You can see here something in the purple um, frame. You can see the cementation that came down into, uh, maybe there was a pocket there. I don't know what was there, but the cementation came down and you can see how the peri-implantitis developed here and the, the amount of bone loss we can see here. On the upper right, we can see on the red frame how wrongly the implant were uh, uh, put in the bone, you can see there is a buccal dehiscence on the, in those implants. And you can see also the crowns of those implants, they are not aligned with the T base. So this is a bacteria accumulation area and we can actually um, help by maybe by changing the crown, uh, and cetera, and cetera. So there is problematic uh, situation here that cause to peri-implant diseases. Now, in order to define what is a peri-implant diseases and what is a peri-implant health, uh, we have this uh, wonderful a consensus report from uh, 2017. Those amazing periodontists and clinicians came together in order to define to us what is peri-implant health, what is peri-implant mucositis, and what is peri-implantitis. And they define as peri-implant health is they're characterized by factors that inflammation free. We need to see the tissue inflammation free by means no erythema, no bleeding, no swelling, no superation, and I also say no pain, because if the patient has pain, it also gives me some red mark, like it it's, um, gives me something to think about. If he has pain in his uh, area of the implant, I need to, uh, to investigate more. So I will say also the absence of pain. Uh, the probing dance, they said something very wise. We cannot possibly, we cannot define the probing depth. Why? Because a tissue can be healthy even around implants, even if the probing depth is more, let's say more than four, five, six millimeters. The tissue can be very sick sometimes uh, at some patient. And what is very important is also that peri-implant health can exist around implants with reduced bone support. As you can see, this is a patient that went through a peri-implant treatment by, by me uh, with a non-surgical treatment. And you can see the peri-implant health around her implants. And she can be with, those, with these implants for years and years if she would keep it this healthy. So reduced bone support still don't say that this is not a peri-implant health. Now they define of peri-implant mucositis as um, well. As some, we can see the inflammation in peri-implant mucositis. We can see bleeding, erythema, swelling, suppuration. We can see, and I add also pain. Usually, the uh, patient said it's sensitivity when he brushes. And it's also, we can see increased probing depths. But how do we know it's increased probing depths? If we actually get in very easy to probe and we can see also bleeding on probing. That's the first sign of, of uh, peri-implant mucositis. And we also know that it causes because there is some etiological factor. That means that if we remove the etiological factor that, that the peri-implant mucositis should be disappear. Like I show you in one of the cases, that the patient has this implant going in, an, uh, uh, in a very angulated and the crown was pushing the gums and causing to the peri-implant mucositis. So once reducing this implants, of course, the peri-implant mucositis disappeared. Last but not least, this is peri-implantitis. This is, we see a lot in our clinic, the peri-implantitis site exhibit clinical signs of inflammation as peri-implant mucositis, bleeding, suppuration, increase of probing, res sometimes recession of the implants, uh, and also radiographic bone loss. How do we know if, it's, uh, some of, if this is like a radiographic uh, bone loss and not something the implant was let's say implanted uh, like that from the beginning, we need to see, of course, the x-rays. But nevertheless, if we see that we are probing and it's easily and it's more than six millimeters and we see in the x-ray there is a bone loss, that means it's a peri-implantitis. 
So what is our goal? Of course, our goal is to keep healthy peri-implant mucosa, to keep it healthy all the time. Let's say we implanted the implant very uh, in a good manner, like we in, in a very healthy bone, all surrounded by at least 1.5 millimeters of bone. But during the years, the, pa the patient developed peri-implant mucositis. And if we, the patient would not be uh, treated for the peri-implant mucositis, uh, he, he can develop to peri-implantitis, that means bone loss, and this is even harder to be treated. And if he won't be treated for the peri-implantitis, then uh, most of those implants going for explantation. 82% of those implants that uh, we see as peri-implantitis go for explantation. And a lot of the patient, uh, and I, if I was the patient, I would like to avoid it if possible. So what is the best therapy for peri-implant diseases? What is my thinking of the best therapy? The best therapy in my eyes, as mentioned before my colleagues, is prevention. And for prevention, one must know the risks. What is the risk for peri-implant diseases? Periodontitis, bad oral hygiene, excess cement, bad restoration, no support, uh, supportive periodontal therapy, no recall or follow-up of our patients, lack of keratinized uh, mucosa, the malposition of the implants and diabetes and smoking are a risk to develop peri-implantitis and peri-implant mucositis. So if we know those risks, we should avoid them on the time of implantation to set a recall for our patient, to see that we are placing the implants on the right manner, to avoid uh, immediate implantation if possible, because this is uh, also a risk of troubles, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I want to show you this case, and I wonder how would you treat this following case? So if you could please uh, go for um, your menti.com um, and vote. So this is a case of a patient with probing depths up to 10 millimeters. She had pain, she had bleeding on probing, she had she has pus, from, pus formation, 50% almost of bone loss. Uh, how do you treat, what, is the, what would be your treatment of choice in this case? Would it be explantation uh, and new implants? Would it be cleaning treatment with, curata, with curettes and antiseptic application? Would it be antibiotics and curettes? Or it would be non-surgical non treatment with diode laser and soft tissue curatage? So after seeing this uh, case, I would like to show you how I treat non-surgically this case, okay? Peri how do I treat, uh, what, what is my, my way of therapy for peri-implant disease non-surgically? So please follow that. Please miss Mrs. Kerlock. She came to the clinic of periodontology in Bern University two and a half years ago. She's 57 years old and healthy. She told me that four years ago, she went through an extensive dental treatment involving extractions of all upper and some of the lower teeth, immediate implantation and cemented implant bridge. Mrs. K complained about severe pain. She expressed deep concern about the fate of the implants and stressed that she has a limited budget. In the intraoral examination, we could observe the massive overgrowth around the peri-implant mucosa, and we detected deep probing depths around implants and severe bleeding on probing, and the x-ray presented bone loss around some implants. We diagnosed the patient with chronic periodontitis, peri-implant mucositis, and peri-implantitis. Before getting to our treatment plan, let me jump to the end result of our treatment. Let me just say, it was a happy end. What would you do if your patient presented chronic periodontitis with peri-implant mucositis and peri-implantitis? What kind of treatment would you choose? For treating chronic periodontitis, the treatment of choice is scaling and root planning. This treatment showed in the literature predictable results in probing depths, bleeding on probing reduction, and gaining clinical attachment. But what kind of treatment would you purpose to treat peri-implant diseases? Would you choose titanium curettes alone, plastic one, or would you add adjunctive therapy like systemic antibiotics? Or would you prefer to add local antibiotics? Shall we use powder air polishing? Shall we use photodynamic therapy? What is the right treatment in this situation? 
in order to get an answer to my dilemma, which treatment protocol is the most efficient for treating peri-implant diseases, I search in PubMed for studies and reviews that might be able to give me a clear answer on this unclear topic. Here are some of the answers I got. Peri-implant mucositis has a cause-effect relationship between plaque accumulation and the development of inflammation. So that means by removing the plaque, we should solve the problem. Well, but it's not so easy. Salvi and Associates 2012 showed reversibility of experimental peri-implant mucositis, but did not always result in complete resolution of inflammation. What about adjunctive antiseptic to mechanical debridement? Conventional non-surgical with adjunctive antiseptic have been suggested to treat the peri-implant diseases. Those adjunctive antiseptic treatments had shown low predictability without complete resolution. So using chloroxidine, iodine, or other antiseptic does not help to resolve the peri-implant mucositis or peri-implantitis. So maybe adjunctive antibiotic will help? Well, the literature shows that adding adjunctive antibiotics to treat the peri-implant diseases showed some small benefit, but also without complete resolution. And moreover, will put the patient in a risk of developing resistance or anaphylactic shock. What about photodynamic therapy? Photodynamic therapy uses the soft laser to bomb the bacterial cells, and it sounds like a good idea. In fact, in 2014, Bassetti and Associates showed improvement in clinical outcomes of initial peri-implantitis using photodynamic therapy, mechanical debridement, and self-performed plaque control up to 12 months. However, complete resolution of mucosal inflammation was not achieved using this method. So what shall we do? Maybe we shall perform surgery? I wouldn't choose surgery as first choice because recent systematic review concluded there is no reliable evidence suggesting which surgical protocol therapy could be the most effective interventions for treating peri-implantitis. So what else can we use? There was a study conducted by Metro and Associates published in 2015. They have shown that non-surgical mechanical therapy of peri-implantitis with adjunctive repeated application of diode laser yields significant clinical improvement. Actually, when you think about it, diode laser characteristics give us exactly what we need. It is antibacterial, it is anticoagulant, it is biostimulator, and it can penetrate by a thin tip to the deep pocket without hurting the surrounding tissue. Can you please explain a bit about this diode laser protocol that we have used? I have used Metro protocol. I first performed mechanical debridement. Then the pockets around the implants were rinsed with saline solution. Adjunctive diode laser was applied three times for 30 seconds in each pocket. This treatment was performed one time a week for three weeks. No antibiotics or antiseptic were applied. Are you curious about the results? In the next pictures, you can observe the healing process after each diode laser application. Those pictures had been taken immediately after the first diode laser treatment. We can observe the massive bleeding and the overgrowth of the gingiva. The next series of pictures present the shrinkage process of the overgrowth peri-implant mucosa after each diode laser and curatage application. After 24 months, we can see clearly the results of our treatment. We can see the stability of the healthy peri-implant mucosa after diode application. This stability reflects in the absence of bleeding, no more deep probing depths, and no further bone loss. There are some disadvantages of this procedure. It can create hot spots on the tip, and that can lead to thermal heat in the soft tissue. Nevertheless, we can control it. It is expensive, and the results not always aesthetically pleasing. It is important to understand that we're going to diagnose more and more peri-implant diseases in our clinic. In fact, Dirks and Tomasi showed that the prevalence of peri-implant mucositis and peri-implantitis has been reported as 43% and 22% respectively. And if peri-implantitis left untreated, it will lead to implant loss. So uh, yes, this is, was my conclusion and that laser therapy with mechanical debridement should be considered as four choice treatment in peri-implant diseases if actually we can 
uh, treat the peri-implant disease. So we need to think if the peri-implant disease is treatable. Uh, as you can see, the, the case at the head was very, very extensively, uh, there was a bone loss, 50% bone loss, there was uh, bleeding. But we first want to give a chance for these implants to survive. The patient had a problem with money and we tried to help her to keep those implants that she was implanted. And I want to show you some case series that uh, me and my colleagues, Barbara Corello, I hope I said her <laughs> last family, the family name correctly. Uh, we both uh, bear, we both periodontists that was um, doing the specialization in Bern University. And we both treat in non-surgically the, the, for peri-implant disease, the diode laser. We found it both very, very effective for uh, several cases that we've been treated. So we took those cases that, and uh, put them together. And uh, we saw that the average age of our patients were 57 years old. Uh, overall, 14 implants with peri-implant disease were detected. 20% of those patients are smoker. Uh, smoking, we, uh, uh, we said that is 10 cigarette uh, per day at least. Probing depths between 6 to 11 millimeters. Bleeding on probing was uh, presented in 100% of the implants. Superation, 80% of the implants. Plaque, 90% of the implants. And periodontitis patient, 60% of the patient were periodontitis patients. The protocols that we uh, got together that uh, all uh, the implants should be at least one year after rehabilitation. Uh, all the implants were treated by removal of the crown and placing a healing cup. Uh, the oral hygiene instruction and periodontal therapy would be given for the patient and we had a recall every three months. We use the same protocol for Metro, the Metro protocol, the same uh, diode laser for, from Weezer laser. And we applied it three times, uh, three times for each pocket for 30 seconds. And we rinse from, uh, with saline or uh, hydrogen peroxide. The laser applied three times uh, in the first time and then seven days after the first time and then another uh, seven days after the second time. Uh, Metro, uh, this is the protocol of Metro 2015, and all the, um, all the application of laser was followed by mechanical debridement. The follow-up was minimum one year. So we had also a follow-up of four years after that. And you can see those uh, part of the cases that we could see of peri-implantitis here, and there was also peri-implant mucositis. And you can see here a 57 years old female, she was healthy with local uh, periodontitis. The implants were placed five years ago. Uh, she came with tremendous pain, superation, um, and swelling, and also 10 millimeter of probing depths, and of course, bleeding on probing. And one year, this is six months after the application, of the, the diode laser with uh, the soft tissue curatage, of course, with the Metro protocol. You can see already the bone uh, healing around the, in the distal implant, the mid implant, and also the, the mesial implant. And when we are looking at uh, those implants after 12 months, you can see that the bone level even raised more up. And we could see that uh, there is almost complete healing around the distal implant and the mesial implant. So this is case number one. Another example is case number two of 56 years old female, healthy, no periodontitis. Uh, she had pain and superation, swelling, bleeding on probing, and the, pro the probing depth was 10 millimeters. Uh, this is a 13 months after uh, the first after the uh, doing the protocol of laser treatment and you can see already how the how she gained some bone. Of course it's not perfect. Of course, there is some bone loss, but the tissue were healthy. As, as we know, the, the definition of peri-implant health, uh, as long as there is no bleeding, no superation, no pain, that could, there is some, it can be presented bone loss, that as long as there is no inflammation around it. The third case, this is a 42 years old uh, male, healthy with local periodontitis, is a social smoker. Uh, the implants uh, placed three years ago, 
he presented suppuration, pain, swelling, nine millimeter of probing depths and bleeding on probings. As you can see the first day, how, the imp how there is like peri-implant disease. It seems like imp the implant is lost. Uh, as you can see also the suppuration coming out of the, of the peri-implant mucosa. And after two years, you could see how the, the area gained bone and you can see the peri-implant health around uh, the, uh, you can see the peri-implant mucosa health around the implant. So this is two years follow-up. Uh, the first case that I want to present to you is a 72 years old male. He's healthy with periodontitis. He's smoking one pack a day for already 60 years. Uh, the implant was placed 10 years ago. He has a superation, as you can see here on the picture, uh, on the clinical picture below. He had swelling and eight millimeter of probing depths and bleeding on probing. As, and one year follow-up after the, uh, our protocol, after metal protocol with laser, you can see there is no superation anymore. We could actually uh, see a peri-implant mucosa health around the implant, and we could see also uh, the gain of bone. So. Uh, as you can see those cases, so uh, the, the laser protocol can actually help for some cases. I think we should try it uh, before we expand. Of course, if there is a reason to try it. Now, my take home message for you is first of all, we need to prevent, try to prevent peri-implant disease by placing implant on the right manner, not, hur not to hurry and not to, um, sometimes we try to hurry and give the patient what they want, but then it could also uh, ruin um, ruin the future of this implant. A baseline x-ray immediately after implantation is an important factor so we can actually measure if something there is some bone loss. Eliminate and reduce risks to develop peri-implant diseases. For example, if, we, if it's a cemented uh, um, restoration, we should take an x-ray just to see if there is no cement under the gums. If this is something we are uh, screwed with an, or cemented, we should see there is no gaps like that. So this is a bacterial retention. Uh, so the implant could be perfect, but if we have some lines, some overhangs like that, it could um, gain more bacteria, so we should eliminate or reduce the risk of the develop to develop peri-implant diseases. Always treat the periodontitis and gingivitis for your patient before you place the implant, and of course after. The hygienist is a very she's a very important factor in our uh, clinic. She's the one that see the patient regularly, so we should also tell her to pay attention to detect the peri-implant diseases and refer them those patients. The hygienist or the dentist, when we see them, we should give oral hygiene instructions, not one time, not even two times, all the time. If we see there is no, they are, they are uh, mistreating their uh, oral hygiene, then we should instruct them again to pay attention to it. Uh, every treatment that I do for peri-implant disease, I remove the crown because the crown, it, it doesn't, it's of course blocking me for penetrate to the area of the problem. I found the diode laser with curatage effective, easy and cheaper way to treat peri-implant disease than to of course explain or to go immediately to surgery. Records in my eyes for peri-implant disease in the beginning should be every two to three months to see the patient is uh, actually uh, doing what you told me and I told him and instruct him. And I also repeat the laser protocol before I go to, uh, let's say, to treat peri-implantitis by, by surgery. So I also apply that because I found that the tissue is much more healthier be uh, when I treat them with laser uh, protocol with the diode laser protocol. So that was my uh, 30 minutes. I hope I'm on, on time. Uh, and uh, I would like to say thank you for coming and listen to me. And I hope I, I helped you. Thank you very much. And this is the password, by the way, the second, of course, 0202 2021. It's the date for today. So you can find this presentation on periohome.com. Thank you very much.
Okay, thank you very much. A uh, little overtime, I have to say. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I'm. <laughs> oh, that's okay. You know, uh, <laughs> I, I I enjoy your enthusiasm for this. I know, of course, from Chani Salvi that in the moment we do a lot of diode laser treatments, and I would say I fully agree with you. This is the first step of treatment. The question, of course, is when you treat, I don't know, 20 cases, how often do you get a recurrence, and what is the influence of the recurrence? Because you will not alter the micro rough implant surface, which is one of the, the risk factors for these uh, peri implant pathology. What do you think about that one? I will, okay, I understand your question. I would like to answer the last, uh, your last uh, question. So as we know, the diode laser, when it's bomb, this, the bacteria cells, and I find that it's also bomb the bacteria cells on the surface of the discs. They cannot survive uh, the, let's say, the laser, um, the laser wave um, on the, imp on the, the, the bacteria that are there on the surface of the implants. And they did some research about that, that uh, if you bomb the bacteria cells on a disc with the uh, implant discs, even if uh, in a surface of, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so they are not surviving. And about the 20 case, um, well, the recurrent, until now, I don't have a recurrent. I have a, a five years experience and I still don't have a recurrent. So I hope it stays like that. You know, know, maybe it will change. I will still follow it. Would be, it would be great to believe that, uh, although I know this is very difficult. Now I'm, I would I'm say following it. the future yeah. will show it, you yeah. see. Uh, a last question. Mm -hmm. If you uh, have to decide to go for an, uh, an open flap procedure, hmm? yeah. what uh, 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 Frank Schwartz is doing, whatever you see, could you also use then the laser to decontaminate the surface before you do some sort of a GPR procedure? Absolutely. There are some cases that show they're using uh, lasers to, uh, to, to bomb again, to con decontaminate the surface of the implant. Mm -hmm. uh, we can do it because we know chloroxidine, uh, if you have blood, it doesn't help. And we also know... Search and uh, that, and uh, iodine it can help but it's still are allergic to iod so you don't want to sometimes to experience this in your clinic and I think lasers are a good a good tool for us to decontaminate these kind of surfaces. Thank you so much for the enthusiasm and great overview. I loved of course this uh, video clip. I know the company they have done that for us as well. And now I think I hand over uh, to Mirko. Okay. Thank